Right. So in Acts chapter number 1, I mean, Acts chapter number 3, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. I want to point out here, it says it's the hour of prayer. And, um, of course, you know, this is, this is specifically saying it's the ninth hour. So at, um, what is that, it's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, our time, the ninth hour. That was the time for prayer in the temple. And that's when people would go. And prayer, I want to hit on this a little bit right off the bat because prayer is something that can be lacking in many Christians' life. It's something that is it's actually hard to do, especially if you pray for an extended period of time. But it's something that we all ought to do. And the Bible talks a lot about prayer. And, and um, you know, Jesus Christ did a lot of prayer. In Matthew 26, 40, he said um, when, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and he was praying, and he was praying to God, he was, you know, he was in, in heaviness because of what was about to happen. He knew it was going to happen. And he was heavy and he was just praying to God. He was pouring out, pouring out his heart. And he has the disciples with him, and, and it says in verse 40 of Matthew 26, it says, And he cometh unto his disciple, unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, Peter, what, could ye not watch with me one hour? So that shows that right away. I mean, Jesus Christ was praying for a full hour straight. He's like, you can't even stay up for one hour? Now, one hour, I mean, most people these days, and, um, you know, myself included on a lot, a, a lot of times, it's, it's hard to, to make the time to pray. I mean, yeah, you might pray for like two minutes or five minutes or maybe something real quick before you eat. But, you know, we have Jesus Christ as an example and many others that spend a significant amount of their time praying. I mean, Daniel made it a point three times in the day to go and pray. I mean, he went in his house, he got on his knees, and he prayed to God. And that's something that, that's time that was devoted specifically for him to be able to go to God and just pray to him. And, um... Uh, you know, the Bible says that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That it's not, you're not just speaking into the wind when you're praying to God. You know, God is powerful. And keep that in mind. Anything that you need, go to God with it. And spend some time talking to Him. God wants to hear from you. God wants to hear your voice. Even Don't even just pray in your heart. I mean, there's nothing wrong with praying in your heart. And there's many examples in the Bible of doing that. Again, I pray in my heart to God a lot. But I think God also wants to hear your voice. He wants to hear you just, just talking to Him audibly. He wants to see you get on your knees and pray, too. Don't just be too flippant about it. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a matter of giving God respect. Um, we ought to get on our knees. We ought to humble ourselves and not just treat God like He's just, just somebody and just talk to Him that way and just be like, Oh, yeah, God, I need help with this. You know, thanks. And just, just be real careless about it. Just kind of... You know, he deserves respect. When you go to him, you ought to entreat God. You know, give him give him respect. It's like, you know, Jesus Christ taught us how to pray. And and giving God the, the accolades and the titles that he deserves is respectful. And we ought to we ought to incorporate that in our prayers. Amen. And we ought to also spend time doing it. You know, the hour of prayer when the disciples came into the temple, I don't I mean, yeah, it was that time that it was that it was happening, but like I don't think the hour, okay, here's the hour of prayer, we're going to pray for five minutes. Like, I don't think that's the way they did it, and I don't think that's the way we should do it either. I mean, yeah, you ought to be praying as much as possible throughout the day, but, but set aside a, a time. I mean, first thing in the day is a great time to do it. Get right with God, get, just get talking to God, communicate with Him, get your mind set for the day, read a little bit of the Bible, do some, spend some time praying, and even at night, too. The problem with doing it at night sometimes is that if you do it right before going to bed, you can be real tired and just fall asleep. Because like I said, I mean, prayer is not easy. Like the disciples fell asleep when, when Jesus was praying. It's not something that's easy, especially when you work hard, you're weary. But it's something that we all ought to do. And the Bible tells us that it will avail much. And there's many examples throughout the Bible of people who've done all kinds of great things and great miracles just through their prayers. Now, um, let's continue reading here. It says, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms, and Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. So here we see, there's a man from, the, from his mother's womb. He's been crippled. He's been lame in his feet. He's not able to walk. So what they do is they bring him, they bring him to the temple, 
right? He sits outside this gate that's called, the name of the gate is called Beautiful. He sits out there, and he's asking people for money. He's asking alms. He's asking for charity. He's asking for people just, hey, you know, he's not able to go up and work. And work. So this isn't just some bum. This isn't just somebody who doesn't want to work. This is someone who's lame in his feet, and he's hanging outside a church. I mean, a church is a good place to, you know, to, to be asking for this stuff. In my opinion, I think there's nothing wrong with what he's doing here. He couldn't work. He was lame from his mother's womb. It wasn't even anything that he had done. And he's asking that, and he's asking for people for alms. And, and then Peter and John are coming up. They're going into the temple. And look at what happens. And he's expecting to, to get something from these guys, right? I mean, they're coming up, and he, and he sets his eyes on them because, uh, you know, Peter looked at him and he said, look on us. So as soon as he said, look at us, the guy's like, oh, okay, cool. Maybe these guys are giving me something. And he says in verse 6, says, then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Well, I like that. He says, look, I don't have any money. Silver and gold have I none. I don't have any money to give you, but what I do have, I am going to give you. Such as I have give I thee. And this is basically, this is a definition of doing things for others. What I have, you know, I'm going to give something to you. I'm going to, I'm going to work for you. I'm going to do things for you to benefit you. And they see someone here in need, and they're giving what they can. This person had a legitimate need, and they're trying to help him. He's out there. He's doing what he can. You know, he needs to survive. They see, hey, here's, here's someone who's got a problem. He's got a serious problem. He's, he's outside of church. He's in the right place. And I'm going to, they, you know what? They see him, they don't just walk right by him, they don't just ignore him. They, they recognize he has a problem, and they've been given something where they're actually able to do something about it. It's not like they have no means of helping the guy either. I mean, that's, a, that's another story. If there's absolutely nothing you can do, you know, there's, there's nothing that's going to be expected of you. But he said, such as I do, such as I have, give I thee. I'm going to give this to you. I have this power. And, of course, they heal him. He heals his legs. And in Matthew 10, 8, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, this was Jesus Christ. He was giving his disciples commandments. In Matthew, he says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. So he's saying, look, you received all this stuff for free. Now I expect you to go and give it for free as well. We have received many things in our lives. We've received many things, a lot of knowledge. We've received all kinds of things from God. We ought to, in turn, also give. Think about salvation. Salvation is not something that you work for. It's not something you earned on your own. Salvation is a free gift. You've received that freely. Anyone who's saved today received salvation for free. It was given to you. It's not something you deserve. It's not something you worked for or earned. You were given it to free. Now, in turn, you ought to help other people to recognize that and to receive that same gift for free. Give that to others. I know you're not the one that's actually saving them in the sense that you're saving their soul like Jesus does, but you need to go out and bring the gospel to them so that they can get saved and that they can also receive that gift because if you don't do it, there's no way they're going to be able to receive that gift. You have freely received. You ought to freely give. Freely give the gospel. It was given to you. In turn, go about and do the same exact thing. Jump down to verse number 12. It says that when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? So he's saying, look, the people saw what happened. It's a great miracle, right? I mean, this guy's up. He's walking around. He was lame from his mother's womb. And the people are starting to wonder and marvel. They're going and looking at, at you know, Peter and John going like, what, you know? Who are these guys? How do they have this, this power? And they're thinking that, like, of their own power they did this. He says, look, don't look at us so earnestly. Don't look at us so, you know, so closely as though by our power, our holiness, we did this. Because he, said, he explains that as Jesus Christ that did it for us. And um, this reminded me of, of a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 7. It says, for who maketh thee to differ from another, and what is thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? And what we can take away from here is a lot of things we can take away from here, but we've received a lot from God. We receive, I mean, you receive a certain power when you go out soul winning. You have the power of the Holy Ghost upon you. You have, you know, God gives you wisdom through, through 
learning through the preaching through the Holy Ghost when you read the Bible. And these are things that are freely given unto you. Don't glory in that fact. Don't glory of like, hey, I'm such a great soul winner. I'm, I'm, I'm this awesome, you know, I've got this thing down, man. I've been doing this for 10 years and, and let, move, step aside, son. Let me, let me take this one. And just have this attitude like all of a sudden it's your power. You know, that, that's, that's going to get this person saved and that, and that you're the one that, that um, you know, you're, there's something super special about you over anyone else. You know, you've been given this freely. You, it's not your own power. It's not your own holiness, you know, that's, that's, that's doing this. It's the power of God when you go out and get someone saved. And that's something we ought to just, just keep that in mind just to keep yourself in check and keep that humble attitude and make sure that you're giving God the credit and God the glory for everything because he's the one that deserves it. Sure. All good gifts, everything that you receive comes from the Father of lights, comes from, from God. Everything that you get that's good is from him. And we ought to give him the due glory, the due honor that he deserves. Now there's a lot of, there's, there's other things that we have. I mean, like everyone receives different types of knowledge. Whatever you've learned from the Bible is given to you. Either by another man, by, by someone who's taught the Bible, some spirit-filled pastor or preacher, or by the Holy Ghost. Either way, that's just something that you've received. And I'm going to add this too, because this is why everything, this is one of the reasons why everything in this church is free. Uh, you know, the, the Bible says that uh, to buy the truth and sell it not. This is something that ought to be free to everyone. Information, especially about God's word, about the Bible. This is what God's interested in. He's not interested in money. He's not interested in physical things. He's interested in people learning the truth and knowing the truth and being made free by the truth. And this is something that we ought to do and make it free to people. Don't, uh, you know, I mean, this might sound silly, but, but we shouldn't charge people to, to hear the truth or, you know, charge admission at the door to come in and, uh, and, and get a seat and, and hear the, the, the wonderful preaching of Pastor Merzins. And, you know, I mean, that would be horrible. We can't do that. And we're going to do everything, all the information, all the Bibles in the back, when we have CDs, DVDs, whatever we have, anything that we have that's the truth, we're, going to, we're not going to sell it. We're going to give it away. We're going to publish it. We're going to try to get it out there as much as possible. And we're going to, I mean, we'll buy it if we have to. We're going to buy the truth. We're not going to sell it. It's going to be made freely available to people. We've received this for free. We're going to give it for free. Amen. Now let's go back to verse number 7. We're going to, we're going to, we skip ahead a little bit to 12. Go back to verse number 7. The Bible says, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, I've read over this quite a bit many times when I've read the Bible, but I mean this is this is this is a great miracle. I'll spend a little bit of time explaining this because there's absolutely no other explanation, no way this could have happened. This man was lame from his mother's womb. So, like, he has never used his legs once. He has never used his legs as a little child or anything. This is not something that just happened to him, you know, a year ago or two years ago or whatever, where all of a sudden he became paralyzed and wasn't able to use his legs. Now, if you've never used your muscles before, if you've never used your legs before, I mean, even if science, even if a medical professional was able to, like, heal you and somehow get you to be able to... to, to to, for your brain to be able to, to cause your, you know, your body to start moving again, there's no way you'd be able to, to leap up and just jump up and be able to use your legs and use those muscles and, and just be leaping and walking and praising God immediately. I mean, as soon as, as, soon as Peter lifts him by the right hand, he picks him up, he leaps up, he jumps up, and he goes into the temple with him praising God. And, I mean, the, the way that just the... The, the, the complete 180 of, of going from worthless legs, good for nothing, just completely void of strength, to being just filled with enough strength to jump up in the air and just being completely fine and completely normal, that, that wholeness, that soundness that he's given them, is, is a great miracle. And I love these stories of people being healed in the Bible. And I think the reason why Jesus did it so much is because he's trying to drive home the fact it's a great illustration, it's a great picture of salvation. When you're, you know, this man was lame. He had no hope of getting those legs fixed. But as soon as, as, soon as he got healed, it was, a, it was by a miracle. 
He had the faith to get healed and, 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 and heal him. And you, you'll find also throughout the Bible, I'll get this a little bit later, but especially in the book of Acts and in, and in the Gospels when Jesus is going around heal, healing people, you'll always, you'll very often find that, you know, they had the faith to be healed. They had, they had the faith to, um, to receive the strength and to be healed. Now look down at, uh, let's continue on here. <clears throat> We already read verse number 12. Let's skip down to verse number 13. It says, The God of Abraham and of Isaac, this is, so this is Peter now explaining, you know, right after he said, don't look at us, you know, it's like, it's not our own holiness that made this man work. It says, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers hath glorified his son, Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Now, these are some really strong, harsh words from Peter to these people, and rightfully so. He says, look, at that. I mean, this is some hard preaching. He sees these people. Now, these people, he has performed a miracle, and they're all in wonderment and in amazement. They're looking at him. just like, wow, look at this miracle that just happened. He's saying, don't look at us as if it's our own holiness. He said, that, you know, the God, basically Jesus Christ, whom ye delivered up and denied him. He said, look, you denied this man. This, the power that, that we're getting, the power we've received has come from the same person that you delivered up to death. You denied him. Pilate was even determined to let him go. Pilate kept going up. If you remember, he said, I find no fault in this man. You know, he's, he's trying to get them just, just to let him go. Like, like look, I, don't, I haven't found any fault in him worthy of death. You know, look, I've beaten them, I've done all this stuff, just trying to placate them and trying to get them to be satisfied. No, they were bloodthirsty, they would not let him go. It says, he was determined to let him go. It says, but ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer. So if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough to, to condemn Jesus Christ to death, they desired a murderer. Instead of Jesus Christ, instead of the Holy One, instead of the just one, instead of the Son of God, they said, no, we want that murderer. That's the wickedness. That was the wicked thoughts of these people. No, we, we want that guy. We want that murderer. Give us him. That, that's our guy. We want him to be set free. But that Jesus, go crucify him and kill him. It says, and killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, where we are witnesses. So he rebukes them sharply here. And you find that too in the book of Acts. We already saw that in, in Acts 1 and 2 where he just rebukes these people sharply. Especially in Acts 2. And we see, who's he talking to here anyways? He goes into the temple. He's not talking to the Roman soldiers. He's not talking to Herod. He's not talking to the ones that might have literally, you know, nailed Jesus to the cross. He's talking to the people who, who made it happen, who are ultimately the most responsible for what happened. He was talking to people in the temple. He's talking to the Jews. And these are the same people as in Matthew 27. You have to turn there. In verse 22, Pilate said unto them, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, let him be crucified. No, it says they all say unto him. There's a group of people gathered together. They say unto him, let him be crucified. Then answered all the people in verse uh, 25. It skips out and says, his blood be on us and on our children. They knew what they were doing. He said, look, put his blood on us and on our children. Because Pilate didn't want to have anything to do with it. These are the same people that Peter's talking about. Now, these people that delivered up Jesus, they're long dead. I mean, they're long gone. Those individuals that were saying, crucify him, crucify him. But I'll tell you what, their religion still exists today. And it's because of that wicked religion that they denied Christ. They denied the, the Jesus Christ come in the flesh. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And what did these people do? They denied the Son. In so doing, they also denied the Father. Judaism, that the religion of the Jews, especially at this time in, in, in Jesus' life, it hasn't changed all the way up to 2013. That religion is a wicked religion. They're an anti-Christ religion. They, they deny the Son. They don't have the Father. A lot of people like to say, oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus... You know, it's still the same God. It's still the Lord. You know, they, they just are a little bit wrong about Jesus. They don't have Jesus, but it's still, it's still the Lord Jehovah. It's still God. 
No. If they don't have the Son, they also don't have the Father. The Bible says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. You can't have one without the other. You either have Jesus Christ and the Father, or you don't have either of them. The Bible says in 2 John 1, 7, it says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and antichrist. The Judaism religion is just deception. The people that espouse that religion, the people that are going to tell you that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh, that's a deceiver. And not only is that a deceiver, that's an antichrist. Yeah. I'm not going, to, I'm not going to, to, to walk on eggshells because I think that the Jews are some special people that deserve to be elevated and raised up when they're the ones that crucified Jesus Christ and put him on the cross. I have no special respect for them. God's not a respecter of persons. The Bible says God's able of these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. You can't count on your physical, who you were born from, your, her, your heredity. If you deny Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, you're an antichrist. You're a deceiver. And I'm not going to give any special respect to that. Now, if you believe that, I'm going to lovingly try to give you the gospel and get you saved and show you, no, 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 look, Jesus Christ is is come. Jesus Christ was here. He came and he died for your sins and he paid for it. You have to believe it and, and receive it. Now, an aside here, just, just briefly, because we're looking at uh, a verse that we leave off on. Verse 15. It says, And kill the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, where we are witnesses. Now, a lot of people today, you know, we have the Jehovah's Witnesses. They say they're witnesses for Jehovah. And I hear a lot of other people, they refer to, to soul winning as witnessing. And, um, you know, I don't, if you use that term, I don't care. But it's something that I don't really use very much because all throughout the Bible, when you see these people who are witnessing, the witnesses were witnesses of Christ's resurrection. The witnesses were the apostles. The reason why they were witnesses is because they actually witnessed it. They saw it. They were with him firsthand. They saw his teaching, and they saw Jesus Christ's body. They saw him physically after he rose again from the dead. They were witnesses of this. So that's why they were some of the best people to go out and tell others, look, we saw this. This happened. I mean, this is, we're not making this stuff up. We're not lying to you. Jesus Christ physically rose again from the grave. He died up on that cross and rose again three days later to pay for your sins. That's why they're witnesses. And again, you know, if you want to use that term, fine. You know, if you want to give someone maybe a witness of, of your own testimony and how you got saved, fine. I do that sometimes, but I don't do that all the time. But that's also why when I go out soul winning, or winning souls to Christ, or preaching the gospel, I don't really call it witnessing, just because I don't think it's a completely accurate term. But that's just an aside. That's just, that's not that big of a deal. I just wanted to point it out here. But um, go ahead and look, jump down to verse number 16 now in Acts 3. It says, And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And again, all throughout the book of Acts, and, and really throughout the Bible, when, when you see people being healed physically, the, the reason is it's usually just because of their faith. And it says in this verse, it says, In his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong. So it's the faith in Jesus Christ that made this man strong. It says, Whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And that's great. You know, that word, those words, perfect soundness. He's complete. He, he's just, now he is complete. Now he has perfect soundness in his body, physically. Again, representing when you have faith, when you put your faith in Christ, you receive perfect soundness in your, in your body. When you receive Christ, you are, you are complete in the sense that you are saved from all of your sins and nothing could ever change that. It, it's perfect. You're, you're complete. You have soundness. <clears throat> Verse 17, it says, And now, brethren... I want that through ignorance he did it, as did also your rulers. You're saying, look, I know, I know you did it through ignorance. Because if you would have, he's just saying this, I think, maybe even just, I mean, he's just ripping on him. He's saying, look, I know you did it through ignorance. Trying to say, like, if you really knew and believed that this was Christ, you wouldn't have done this. I know you did it through ignorance. Look, verse 18 says, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Now notice it says there, 
by the mouth of all his prophets. Every prophet of God, every prophet of God in the Old Testament, every single one of them spoke about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is, I mean, he is the word, and he is the main focus of the Bible. He is, that's the whole point. Of course, every single holy prophet that God has had, look at verse, uh, verse 21, it says it again. It says, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, since the world began. So not even just the prophets in the Bible, like in God's word in the Old Testament. It says, all of his holy prophets since the world began. So going back to Adam and Eve. Going back to Adam, right? Since the world began, whoever was considered a prophet of God, they spake of Jesus Christ. They prophesied of Jesus Christ. They spoke of, of the Christ that was going to come. And that's pretty amazing because, I mean... Salvation was, the gospel was preached to everyone throughout all time. Christ was preached in one way or another. The Messiah was preached, Christ was preached, going all the way back to the beginning. There was not a time, it's not, it wasn't, oh, people in the Old Testament were saved by their, their, the blood of bulls and goats and these sacrifices. That didn't even come until the Mosaic Law, which was already, you know, thousands of years had passed, or thousands of years, you know, had already gone by of people living on this earth and dying, it's not, that's not the sacrifices that saved. It was, the, it was this, the preaching of, of God's holy word that Christ was going to come and make an atonement for their sins. Everything else is just a picture. And, um, and just to prove that further, you know, you think of the, the woman at the well in John 4, said, the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Again, it's just a little bit further proof that the people knew. You know, this isn't just some new doctrine that was taught. There wasn't just some, you know, some guy that was uh, just a deceiver or trying to trick people and, and twisting scripture and stuff. The people were already looking for Christ. They knew that Christ was coming. He came and he fulfilled all the prophecies that were spoken in the Bible. He came and completely fulfilled that. And I think it's also interesting, too, that so far we've seen in Acts chapter 1, 2, and now in 3, there's these references to the end times. And um, after verse 18, it says, All his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. He's telling them here, look, Jesus Christ is coming back at the time of excuse me, restitution of all things. So when it's time to just bring everything unto judgment, to bring everything together, to restore, it's just the restitution of everything, Jesus Christ is coming back. This is a third reference here in the first three chapters of Acts that, that they're trying to explain that Jesus Christ is coming back in the return of Christ. Let's continue reading here. It says, For Moses, in verse 22, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So he's given up Moses' words. This is a quote from Moses in the Old Testament because this is the man that these people claim to believe. They claim to believe in Moses. So they're saying, okay, here, I'll give you something that Moses said. Because Moses said, as a prophet, you know, shall your God raise up unto you. He said, it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Peter's not holding back. He's telling the truth. He lays it out. He lays it out saying that you're the one that put him up to death. You're the one that did this. And not only that, he's saying, look, Every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. This is not the positive only messages that you hear today. And this is why we're not going to have just positive only messages in this church. People need to hear the truth. This is the truth. This is what, I mean, this is God's word. He's saying, look, this is the way it is. You don't have to like it, but it's the way it is. If you don't hear this prophet, if you don't hear Jesus Christ, 
You're going to be destroyed from off the earth. You're going to be, you know, there's no hope for you. It says in verse 24, Yea, and all the prophets, from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. And look, don't you get it? Everybody has foretold of this. Look at the Old Testament. Look at the law. Look at Moses. Look at Samuel. Look at all the prophets. They all said that these days were coming. The Christ has come and he's here. It says, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. <clears throat> now we see here, I'm going to take a little bit of time and just, just expound this last verse. It says, Unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you. So he said, God sent Jesus Christ to bless him. And what does that mean? It says, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Jesus preached against sin. Again, it wasn't all just his love message. Jesus preached hard against sin, just like Peter's doing here. He's rebuking these people, and you know what he's doing? He's trying to get to their heart. He's trying to show them, look, you're wicked. You need to be saved. You've done wrong. You've sinned against God. God's telling you, you need to believe this. I'm giving you scripture. I'm showing you this. You need to be converted. You need to repent. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Because right now they're not blotted out. Right now you're going to be destroyed unless you believe on him. That was prophesied that all the Old Testament pro uh, prophets spoke about. You need to believe on him. It says that he sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Turning away from your iniquities and hearing the preaching of turning away from your iniquities is a blessing. It's not a bad thing. It's not that God says, you know, oh yeah, I don't want you to have any fun. So I'm just going to lay out all these rules and you better follow them because I just want you to be miserable throughout your life. That's a blessing, man. If someone, if you hear preaching, if you hear preaching and, it, and, it's, and it's preaching against iniquities, it's preaching against some sin. It's preaching against something you're doing. Count that as a blessing, man. Take that to heart. Because someone loves you enough to tell you the truth. Someone loves you enough to risk maybe you not ever coming back and talking to you again. Someone loves you enough to say, you know what? I care so much about you that this might make you mad. This might offend you. You might never want to see my face again and never speak to me again. Or make you even want to come at me or physically hurt me, or whatever, whatever the case may be. I don't know what it's going to do to you, but it has that potential, right? I mean, if I were to say, hey, man, you're doing a good job, you're doing great, everything's going well for you, you don't have very much risk there. You don't have very much risk of, of losing a relationship or losing a friend or, or never speaking to someone again. But when someone's going to point out iniquity and someone's going to preach against iniquity, that person truly does care for you, even though it might not seem like it at the time. It stings sometimes to be confronted with your sins. It stings. It doesn't feel good. But I'll tell you what, the person that's going to try to point it out to you, it loves you. And they, it's, it's because, I mean, if it's truly an iniquity, if it's, if it's something that's, that's a sin against God, if it's something that the Bible says, the Bible teaches, it's God's Word. You know, it's, it's not someone having it out for you. When I preach on sin, whatever the sin may be, and I, you know what? The thing is, and here's the thing you got to remember, you know, the pastor or the preacher, they probably don't know what your sins are. I mean, there's a lot of people in this room right now, I don't know your sins. I mean, the only ones I might know is maybe my wife and kids, but that's a little bit different. I'm with them all the time. But I still don't even know all, of her, all their sins, you know? And it's not that I have it out for you. I probably don't even know. So if something, if something hits you, you know, it's not me trying to just like, I'm going to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you feel this. But even if I did, like, if it's, if it's from the Bible, like, let's say I did know one of your sins, the reason why I would preach on it is because I love you. It's because, hey, this is a problem in this person's life, and maybe they don't even realize it. Maybe it's through ignorance. I want that through ignorance you did it. Maybe it's through ignorance. I don't know. I'm going to point it out, though, and I'm going to show it. And I'm also going to put it in the same light that God puts it in. Peter didn't dance around it and say, yeah, you know what, you guys, you guys sin. But it's okay, I mean, we're all sinners. I know we're all sinners, but yeah, you, got, you guys sin, and you shouldn't do that anymore. 
He said, no. I mean, he, he, he laid out how wicked it was. He said, you desire to murder. You, with wicked hands, you know, you, you sent the just one, the holy one, the son of God, to death. You're the one that denied him. But in, in all that hard preaching and all that, you know, laying out, I mean, you, you need to hear that. You need to hear the truth. But he also gave him a way out. You know, he told him, look, you need to repent. He gave him the answer. This is what you need to do. You need to obey God. You need to follow him. You need to repent. You need your sins to be blotted out. You need to put your faith in that Christ that came. We ought to have the right heart. Let's have, we, we need to have a humble heart. When you hear the preaching against sin, you really need to just, just take it to heart and, and realize that you know, God loves you. That's why he gave us his book and he's, and he's telling us about these things. Because ultimately when you, when you can correct those issues, you're going to be blessed for it and your, and your life is going to be that much better in the end. And um, even if you can't see that beforehand, it's the truth. And um, so a few things from this chapter. Try to make it a point and, and make a change. If you, if you don't do it right now, make a point to, to take time to pray. Take an hour to pray. Whatever, whatever time it is that you feel that you need to do. And, and an hour is common in the Bible. People take in a full hour to pray. Dedicate that time to God. To make that, make that time for Him. Whatever, whatever you think that, that it ought to be. I mean, and, and it ought to be something at least like that much. Make it significant. Don't, don't do this two or three minute stuff. Give God the respect that He deserves. And, um, you know, when you hear preaching, when you hear this, this preaching on, on sins... You know, the person loves you, but but also don't, you know, if, if any of you ever ever decide to preach, I mean, even when you're preaching the gospel, don't leave out the parts about hell. Don't leave out the parts about the sin. They're important. I mean, that's what's pointing people to, to needing a Savior. You know, those that be whole need not a physician. But everyone that's unsaved is not whole. Everybody's got that gap, and, and they need to understand that. You don't have to be a jerk about it, but you don't have to lighten up on it either. You don't have to, you don't have to, to tone it down. People need to hear that. They need to hear that what they've done is wrong. And, um, but also, also let them understand personally you know, what Jesus Christ did for them. And I was talking to a girl today out soul winning, and uh, you know, I, hadn't, I hadn't ever really put it this way before. And so I, lo I love soul winning. You know, it always gets new. I mean, there's always things that you pick up. There's always things that you learn. And you can always sharpen your skills and do a little bit better. But I was telling this girl today, like, look, You've sinned and you have a soul. Your soul's going to end up somewhere. And you dead sure don't want it ending up in heaven. Hell's a real place. And, you know, you make sure that they understand that. I mean, it, just think about it. Stop and take the time. And this, this, thankfully, you know, this girl took the time to actually listen to what I had to say and showing her from the Bible. I said, you have a soul. It's going to end up somewhere. Now, you've, you've already sinned and that's what you deserve. But Jesus Christ came he did not deserve any of this stuff, and I really kind of laid out how you know how great he was. You know, obviously he did all these miracles. He helped people. You know, he was helping the poor. He helped heal the sick. He didn't deserve his punishment, and and, and I also went into detail about how how gruesome it was. How he was able to see his rib cage. They beat him so bad. They whipped him so bad. His face, his visage was marred more than any man. He you know. He suffered a lot. He was spit in the face. God in the flesh, the Son of God come down, was spit in his face, mocked, ridiculed, crown of thorns, everything. I mean, bleeding, he could see his bones, and then they finally just hang his carcass up on the cross and nail him to it. Just, just total shame and, and, and wickedness, what they did to him. But when you think about, he let all that happen for you, to the sins that you did, that's why he was up there. That's why he did that. That's why all those things happened. He let those things happen. was for you. It was for your individual sins. Whatever is, think about some of the things you've done that were against God. He did that for you. Because you did those things. And, and it's because he loves you. And just to receive that gift. And that was something, you know, making it personal. I think some people need to hear that. We need to hear that in the preaching. That's why when we preach on sin, I... You know, there, there's no specific sins that I could find in, in this chapter to really rail on. But, um, and, and I'm just trying to expound on, on the chapter that we're going through. But 
I'm not going to lay up on, on any specific sin. If it's in the Bible, it's in the Bible. And, and we need to get specific. And you need to get specific in your own life and just, just analyze everything. Because, um, you know, we, we need to make those changes that are necessary. And don't, uh, don't, don't ignore it and don't dance from it. But let's have our, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the book of Acts. God, I thank you for, for the great stories we're going to read about coming up and, and all the great things that the, the, the apostles did and um, the great power that you gave them, dear Lord, and, and all the credit that, that you deserve. And we thank you so much for the gifts that we've received. Lord, I pray that you please help us to, to take all of what we have and to minister unto others, dear God, that, that all the things that we've received freely, help us just to freely give them to others. Help us to, to use our time wisely to be able to do so, to to not just sit back and just take, take, take all these great things that you have for us, but to go out and to, to give. And, um, you know, you, you, you've taught us that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive anyway. So help us to uh, realize that joy that you have for us when we do go out and give. Man, I can't imagine how happy Peter and John must have been when, when that man just leapt up and leapt for joy and, and praised your name. Man, how exciting that would be. To, to witness that and to be there and to be a part of that. And all because they decided to stop and to help someone else out and, and to give unto them since they had been given so much from you. And Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.